Um, maybe you could just start with a bit of how important that collaboration and partnership really is in fostering growth. Th thanks, Carl. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, uh, collaboration, uh, working across public, private academia is absolutely essential in delivering the growth that we need to see uh, in Birmingham. And, and what I would say is that the, the, the Good Growth for Cities Index is incredibly helpful in giving us a, a, a good guide on the factors that make up good growth. But I would, I would spin it in a different way and say it's all about inclusive growth. Um, uh, the other thing I would say is that I'm really impatient because uh, Birmingham shouldn't be ranked 50. And uh, part of our plan for growth is making sure that we can accelerate up that index in, in a very uh, well thought through and intentional way. So that's the first thing. Now, now I see that the, the plan, uh, the, the framework, the big city plan, uh, as demonstrating the, the role that uh, Birmingham City Council has in placemaking. And, and I'm really clear that the placemaking is about, is about the picture of the, of the city, but the picture is made up of lots of different bits of a, of a jigsaw puzzle. Now, if we want to achieve that picture of good, vibrant, sustainable growth that then impacts uh, on our communities and, and therefore makes our communities vibrant and sustainable, we've got to be really intentional about how we put those jigsaw bits of the jigsaw puzzle together. And uh, people responsible for, for different bits of that jigsaw are our private sector partners, our other statutory partners, our government, our regional government. You know, so there is the need for collaboration. Uh, that, that's the first point. Uh, I'm also clear that, that the plan has to be a plan that enables and supports growth. So we've got to be really clear about uh, how we plan, how we use assets, how we liberate uh, global investment, uh, and to do that in a partnership and collaborative way as well. Because ultimately, we all want the same, whether we're you know, PwC or one of our major uh, house developers or one of our global investors or indeed our communities. We all want the same thing, which is a strong, vibrant, sustainable economy that will ultimately then help us and enable us to deliver and address some of the deep rooted community and social problems that we've got in the city. So for me, collaboration, working in partnership across that picture with other partners is absolutely essential to ensure success and ultimately see Birmingham rise up that index. That's brilliant. Thank, thanks, Deborah. And actually, I was at the House of Commons when the plan uh, was was launched and and that importance of the plan, the certainty that that provides and, and hearing from, as you say, one of the social housing providers, it really gave them the confidence that they could then invest in the city and grow and build. And I think the combination of the two really does make make a difference. Absolutely. And um, Rachel, maybe I could just come to you and just talk a little bit about some of the things that, that you're seeing as to partnerships and how they're working innovatively to achieve good growth for the cities and, and their citizens. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Carl. And I think there's lots of examples happening across across the UK, actually. And I guess I wanted just to bring just a couple to life this morning. We've only got a short amount of time. I guess for me, it's about investment in innovation and in skills. So if I think about innovation, one of the areas that you know we've been closely involved in is the Cardiff Capital Region and their Innovation Investment Fund. And excitingly, they announced their first investment this week, which is really trying to generate innovation and build innovation in the business community to create that growth for everybody, that inclusive growth in that region. So I think we're really excited to be working with um, Capricorn Fund Management and, and the uh, CCR to, to deliver that this, this week. I guess the other part for me that I'm very passionate about is skills. Um, and we've been really proud to work with the Northwest Tech Talent Consortium, which Janice and the team are a huge part of. And for us, that's been about how do you invest together to build talent, you know, from schools, colleges, universities and beyond to really rather than trying to take each other's talent, how do you really build talent to really generate growth in, in a city? So I think I don't think it'd be worth Janice hearing a bit from you about that. But, but I think investing in skills together is one of the key planks for me. 
Thanks, Rachel. So as we're fond of saying in the GM region, we do things differently. And I think that one aspect of that difference is the emphasis on collaboration to address the big issues, the wicked problems. So the Northwest Tech Talent Consortium was founded on the back of a piece of research that identified a clear and pressing need to increase the size of the tech talent pipeline within our region. And we also need to ensure that there is a better level of diversity and inclusivity across all types of roles in tech and across all levels. Significantly, the report also concluded that the size and scale of those issues was such that the only hope we had was to adopt an integrated and collaborative approach between employers, educational providers and policymakers in order to address them. So the consortium brings together a dozen or so tech companies, some of which would normally be in competition with each other to work collaboratively for the good of the region and the individual members by increasing the number of young people, especially from underrepresented groups, to consider a career in tech. Excellent. That's really helpful, Janice. I think the that piece about the skills aspect of this, I think, is often really mis, uh, misunderstood or maybe not prioritized enough. You, you talk there a bit about, and, and we've got this sort of this working together. One of the interesting things I think is interesting, how we get from a this sort of version of collaboration to consortium and how do we really get something really, where it really does work together so we get true delivery? Because I've often seen a, a willingness for people to do things that you know are coming together, but it's all great ideas and not great action. Maybe some thoughts there as to how you've really made that work? Absolutely. And I do want to stress that the consortium has an emphasis on impact-driven action. We were really clear from the start that we didn't want to replicate what was already available, nor did we want to waste time with each member reinventing the wheel and duplicating effort. Instead, we focus on the value add associated with the scale of the collected of the collective and the scale of activity and impact that that makes possible. So in July, for example, we all came together to um, deliver a teacher insight day at the university where staff from all of the regional colleges and FE providers could come and meet with and learn from a range of key names in the tech sector, including Microsoft, Arup, TalkTalk, Siemens, GHCQ, ITV, etc. The amazing thing was that there were over 30 presentations on a single, you know, half day about all things tech, whether that was about apprenticeship routes, the wide range of roles available in the tech center, their own skill development, or their understanding of AI. Teachers and career advisors then go back into their schools armed with that in enhanced understanding, and they share it with their students. So once again, the impact is magnified. Yeah, brilliant. And I think how we get that that focus on the, the people working truly together to deliver action and, and outcomes is, is absolutely critical. The, the other bit you've touched on there, Janice, which I'd like to pick up now is, is sort of this, this view around cities playing to their strengths. You know, you focused very much there and Manchester more broadly around technology and tech talent. Um, we've seen as we look through the Good Growth Index where you see cities really playing to their own uh, investment areas or the things that they have as real assets in those cities, you make a difference. And I think some of those economic and industrial clusters are really providing that, that boost to economic growth. You know, we see it in Oxford, we see it in Cambridge with science and innovation, we see it in some of the creative clusters, for example, in, in Birmingham and Bristol. Um, and, and Rachel, we've been working quite a bit on some of our investments in Cardiff, in Bradford, in Belfast, and, and really trying to think about that, that public sector combination but also specifically on the strengths of the local location. Maybe just a few thoughts around that. Absolutely. I mean, uh, let's let's think about advanced manufacturing. There is no doubt that GM is an area of excellence for advanced manufacturing. We are the home of the Henry Royce Institute, the National Graphene Institute at the University of Manchester, the North of England Robotics Centre, or NERIC here at the University of Salford, Print City at MMU, and Adam Valley in Rochdale. So across the region and a range of providers, we have all the technology solutions to aid growth without duplicating or redundancy. To say a little bit more about NERIC as the example that I'm most familiar with, it exists to support innovative approaches to technology adoption. And thinking specifically about inclusive growth, 
It provides SMEs with access to cutting edge robotics that they don't otherwise have access to. You know, the issue that SMEs face is that there is such a wide variety of technological solutions in the advanced manufacturing field that it can be overwhelming. It can also be terribly, terribly expensive. So what NERIC provides is access to different technologies plus innovation adaptation support for SMEs to test out different solutions prior to purchasing. And that helps to ensure that SMEs aren't left behind in the technological revolution. And that's why the focus is still on inclusive growth. Yeah. Yeah, and I think brilliant. it might be worth, Carl, I guess, because obviously, we, we, as you said, we've invested in different regions. But actually, one of the things that's been exciting is working with people like Deborah around sort of the investment that Birmingham's done around sort of creating the financial services sector, really building that out in, in Birmingham. So I do wonder if it's worth, Deborah, talking a bit about where you are on that journey. You've made huge strides. What else? sits alongside that where next and I know you've, you've got some recent um, successful organizations that have moved into Burma I don't know if it's worth sharing a bit about how that's happened yeah really happy to do that I mean I mean I think the important the important message really from from the city is is to ensure well the important message is that we are grabbing hold of the momentum that we're seeing in uh, in the growth of financial services and uh, innovation and digital. And, and I'll talk a little bit about, about those and what I mean by that. So uh, there is real momentum, um, certainly in financial services and success breeds success, right? So so n- not exclusively on the back of HS2, but primarily because of the promise of HS2 and what that means for our economy and opening up the economy of Birmingham means that we've seen you know, major global firms decide to place their headquarters in the city, people like Goldman Sachs, HSBC, Arabs, and dare I say PwC. So there is a real ecosystem of financial services, you know, that are creating a real momentum and creating this sense of uh, a centre of financial financial uh, operations. The other thing I would say is that is that it's not just, this sector isn't just important for Birmingham, it's vitally important for Birmingham. It's also vitally important for the UK and, dare I say, it's vitally important and influential as a global kind of sector as well. So why wouldn't we want to grab hold of that sector, encourage it and enable it to grow? So that's that's the th- first thing I would say. The, the, the other ish, growth sector for us is innovation and digital. And, and like Janice, um, you know, we can't claim the successes that, that um, Oxford has seen, but, but actually we're on that journey and we're snapping at your heels. Because, you know, innovation and digital, again, is one of those influential sectors globally um, that we want to foster and and enable. And we've recently launched the Birmingham Innovation Center, which we're really excited about, but also really proud of as well. And we're referring to it as a a triple helix partnership, which sounds very grand, but essentially it's a very tight partnership between public, private sector and academia. You know, and we're hoping... To, to develop this innovation ecosystem that that, re, that co-locates industry, business entrepreneurs, startup founders, you know, together with staff and students from academia, really grabbing hold of those 90,000 graduates that, that graduate from our five universities on an annual basis. And we want to keep the best. We want to keep those really great graduates focused on helping us develop and and grow uh, our economy, but it, but it's also about bringing digital cutting edge research as well into a range a range of factors because that's the future. You know that is the future of economic growth, being able to harness that digital innovation that we see across the world. And, and, and Deborah, I was really struck when we had a sort of preparation call earlier in the week when you you talked a bit about the work you're doing with schools and universities, but actually some of the work you're having to do much earlier. Because, as you said, there's there's challenges much earlier the way you need to intervene and support to actually make that growth more inclusive. So I don't know whether you wanted to bring to life some of that because I was, I thought that was really exciting the work that you're starting to do in that area. Yeah, and and that, and, and and thanks, Rachel. I, I, so you know, I'm really passionate about ensuring that all growth that we see across the city is inclusive. And I, and I and again, I I reinforce my understanding and my belief in that you can't have good, strong economies without good, strong communities um, and, and people. So so the Good Growth Index, 
you know, is absolutely right on focusing on all of those elements of, of growth. And it's not just about investment in infrastructure and stuff. It's also got to be about um, investing in, in people as well. And, and we've got to be really intentional about how we make sure that growth um, supports the growth of our communities as well. And, and some of the stats that I used in, in our introduction when we were discussing this was, was that a third of our children are not school ready in the city by the age of four. And you know what that means. They can't read, they can't, you know, they can't uh, engage socially, you know, and, and it is that significant disadvantage that those children will carry throughout their education career and then on into the world of, of work. So it's it kind of feels to me like it's almost like a ticking time bomb. We know that, so we've got to be intentional in in kind of supporting that and dealing with that. And then, and then of course, we've got 40% of our kids who are growing up in, in um, households that are, you know, identified as, as um, living in poverty, you know. So, so that disadvantage, you know, that, that, that kind of resource that we've got in the city, you know, will always operate at suboptimal if we don't ensure that we support and encourage and work with our communities to deal with that, because we won't have the skills base you know, that indigenous skills base that we need in, in the city to deliver the jobs, to support the growth, etc. So so we've got to be really in, intentional in the way in which we manage that that growth. And, you know, it's it's got to be part of those, you know, those jigsaw puzzle, you know, parts of the jigsaw puzzle that I referred to um, to earlier. You know, you, you, you can't just focus on building a house. You've also got to focus on enabling people to develop the skills to do the work that needs to be done, for example. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. And I think, um, you know, I, I'm I'm a financial services person by background and, and actually have benefited a lot from the, the growth that you you focused on in, in Birmingham, Deborah, around that financial services hub and, and have serviced a number of the clients there. And it, it's amazing, isn't it? When you get those hubs of skills, industry, sector specialism, it's a multiplier effect because it attracts more and, and brings people in. I, I'm interested to, to get from from both of you maybe now and I'll come to Janice first and then to, to you afterwards Deborah we both of you are sort of coming at this one from an academic perspective one from a, a more government local government perspective how do you go about attracting the businesses in to fuel that growth what are the things that you do to help bring some of that to life and bring that private sector I guess appetite and ambition into into the local city and region so maybe to Janice first I think there's a obvious case for this in terms of our growth as a digital city region. I mean, we are the fast, fastest growing digital hub in Europe now with, I think last year there was about 520 million of inward investment. We have eight unicorns in GM, et cetera, uh, some future corns as well. And I think there is something about setting up an ecosystem that attracts others. It's a bit of success, you know, garners and brings in additional success. And I think that's certainly been the case um, in Greater Manchester. There's there's something that asks acts as a catalyst. And, you know, you can think about uh, the move of BBC to Salford. Um, not only did that get Salford into everybody's front rooms and into the nation's consciousness, but it allowed a whole range of media and pre and post production companies to spring up around that. And there is now an absolutely thriving ecosystem at MCUK in Salford. Brilliant. Uh, really great examples there, Janice. Thank you. Deborah, from your perspective, that attraction of business, maybe? Yeah. And, uh, so so I'm not I'm not saying it's easy, but um, but we have been really successful in in attracting large companies and significant global investment. And the, we've been able to do that by having different conversations. So the conversation is, look, you, you know, Birmingham is ambitious. It's on a trajectory of growth, but, but the growth has got to be done in the right way. So if you want to come and invest in this city, we want to have a conversation with you about the investment that you make. And it's, and it's long term, it's substantial, and you need to work with us to address some of the big challenges we've got in the city. And, and by doing that, you, you know, you will see benefits in spades. So there are companies that we're working with at the moment, like Lendlease, who are going to be ultimately investing up to £2 billion in creating a new inner city community in Birmingham. Now, that's not going to happen overnight, and it's going to be almost a generational effort. It's going to be at least 10, 15 years 
to build out that new community. So, so they have an investment in the city in a way that other companies in the past haven't. So, so we are talking, to, we are having different conversations about what that investment looks like. And, you, you know, ultimately, they've got a, they're thoughtful about their bottom line. Of course they are. But equally, they also understand the responsibility they've got to ensure that their investment is sustainable and, and, and is invested in, in the right way. And what I would say is that, you know, the, the conversations we're having with the global investment, investors on this basis is, is seeing more, more interest than ever before. They're not running for the hills and saying, no, you know, that's not the kind of investment we want to make. So there is, I think there is a real shift in the way in which large scale investors are now seeing um, the way in which they want to invest um, in places. And again, I would say success breeds success. We can demonstrate, we can point to some major, major complex long term investments that have weathered the storm of, of global economic turmoil and, it, uh, and are now actually, you know, uh, representing real success and return on investment. So it's, it's really important for me that the conversations we have with investors is different. And, and as a result of the Commonwealth Games, where we open the, the city up to the world, you know, we're seeing more interest than we've ever seen before. Yeah, and I think that the point you make about the, that shift from businesses and actually how they are wanting to be part of city economic growth is definitely something we're seeing. You know, we're having different conversations about place-based strategies for organisations. Mm -hmm. They're not just wanting to grab all the skills and, and get it for the best of their business. They're wanting to give back. It's a, it's a change, I think, in the business community, which is, yeah. which is brilliant. And we need to collectively all, all grab hold of that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's amazing how time flies when you're having fun. Um, now, there's there's been a number of things for me that have, that have come through, whether it be that importance of the collaboration that, that we have, but actually probably more so than that, the consortium type behaviours we're seeing between public private sectors that's really flowing through, the importance of inclusive growth, it being there for everyone so that it changes the city and, and also that focus on making sure cities and regions play to their their strategic strengths. I'd like just to come to each of you now in sort of closing and just sort of a final reflection or takeaway action for those on the call that you think would be useful for them as they're thinking about how they can make a difference in, the, in their places. And, and maybe, uh, Rachel, I'll come to you first if I can. Thanks, Carl. I think for me, what's made the difference where we have been involved as a local employer is actually getting together and really understanding where other people are and what they're looking for. And then, as Jana said, being able to corral around actually them coming in just with your own perspective. So I think it's really investing in those local relationships to really understand what the skills needs are and what you can invest in together to make a difference. Brilliant. Thank you, Janice. Can I come to you? Um, reading the report, I was surprised by the low score that skills received as a measure of economic success. It was third from bottom at 4%, rounded up from 3.9%. Now, to give you a sense of comparison, income distribution had the highest score at 16%. And what that says to me is that we have a communication issue and we aren't doing enough to promote skills as a path to both individual and regional success, productivity and inclusive growth and success. So my one action to take away would be to work even harder in spreading the word about skills. Yeah, I, I completely agree on that skills point. I think there is there is a definite need to increase the narrative, especially when you look at the transition we are expecting to see on the skills agenda, whether it be digital or even in the in the green economy, some of the things we're going to have to do to transition to uh, the, I guess, a greener and more sustainable environment that will require a big skill shift. So I completely agree with that, Janice. And Deborah, finally to you. Yeah, so so we, we we haven't had time to talk about the impact of the Commonwealth Games um, on on the city, which which is a shame because we could have had a whole session about that. But 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 what hosting the Commonwealth Games did was was put Birmingham as a place on the global stage, and and it was extraordinary. It was absolutely extraordinary and demonstrated the potential of Birmingham as a place to deliver growth and to build on the success of the games. But the success of the games was all about people across the whole sectors working together in a profoundly enabling and supportive way. So the big message for me is to go back to my original, which was my original statement, which was, you know, to build a successful economy in a place demands a whole range of jigsaw pieces being put together. 
So, so the big takeaway for me is that everyone has to work together across the piece in order to deliver that big picture of sustainable, inclusive growth in Birmingham. Couldn't agree more. And I, and I would also say the Commonwealth Games was a fabulous success. I, I enjoyed a number of the events uh, there. I thought the uh, the stadium, Alexander Stadium, was uh, was fabulous, as well as uh, the great swimming events as well. And actually, the, right in the city centre, the buzz in and around uh, the main square was just was just superb. And I think seeing that multicultural dimensions and all of the different people coming together, as you say, it put Birmingham on a different stage, which I think was, was fabulous to see. But thank you all very much. Really do appreciate uh, your time this morning. And I hope everyone got something uh, from that. Obviously, if people would like more information, uh, the Good Greater Cities report is available for everyone uh, very much linked to, uh, to this particular event. And um, there are some really interesting aspects in there as to how you get the most from a city and really get some of those partnerships working well together. So thank you all very much. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, folks. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.